So with, with this, we will proceed with our uh, final speaker for, for today, which is uh, Professor Claire Gray from the University of Cambridge, where she has been since 2010 after conducting research in many other countries, including the Netherlands, the United States and France, even in the industrial setting at uh, DuPont. Her group studies solid state systems, most notably batteries, supercapacitors, as well as fuel cell, me cell membranes, by using a range of techniques, including NMR, X-ray and neutron scattering, electron microscopy, as well as computational chemistry. She has received numerous awards, most recently the Royal Society 2020 Hughes Medal, recognizing the contributions to energy research within her highly international research team. Her talk today is on developing and applying new tools to understand how materials for lithium and beyond lithium battery technologies function and fail that we very much look forward to. So with this, Professor Gray, Claire, the virtual floor is yours. So thank you very much. And I hope you can hear me. And um, I must apologize for the technical issues. And I'm grateful that some of you are still here to listen to me. So what I want to do in the, the brief time we have here is just to tell you a little bit about our work to look at lithium and beyond lithium technologies and to develop new metrologies to understand how batteries function and then hopefully mitigate their failure mechanisms. And so just to remind people why this is important, of course, the area of portable electronics and the computers that we're all using to listen to these talks are all powered by batteries. But the bigger challenges are associated with electrification of transport and then the ultimate challenge is to really make an impact on storage and the grid, where uh, the grid really isn't a mechanism for storing. And so things like batteries, if we can make them cheaper and last longer, are poised to make a very important contribution. Of course, it has to be done in a sustainable fashion. I think one thing that we have to appreciate is that the battery that was invented, or the lithium-ion battery that was invented more than 25 years ago, has come down by uh, more than a factor of 10 in price. It's come up um, in energy, energy density by more than a factor of three, but we're very close to the theoretical limits. And so we need radically new approaches to make sufficient impact in this area to really do something in the grid storage applications and also in, in, in electrification of transport. But we have to do this in both a sustainable way and also a safe way. And this is the, the, the Samsung Galaxy Notebook that had problems just because 10% extra capacity was trying to be fit into it the same volume. And so just to touch a little bit onto the sustainability issues, the large numbers of gigafactories that are being made worldwide have got tremendous uh, resource issues, particularly with cobalt. And then even the shift now of electric vehicle battery manufacturers away from cobalt to nickel is now pushing the resource issues onto nickel. And so the question is, what can we do as chemists to change this picture? This is now the issue of the lithium resources. So the lithiums come in brines shown here. Um, uh, the brines, Brian shown here, but they're being pumped out of the ground in some of the most dry parts of the world. And so as the lithium continues to be used, you have to worry about the communities that live in these regions and that depend on the water. So I would argue that in order to make more sustainable batteries, we need to think about mitigating battery degradation and increasing lifetime. And in order to do that, it's important to understand how the materials function from the atomistic level all the way through to the pack level. And um, I and my group have spent the last few years trying to develop in situ NMR methods to enable some of these studies. So it's not quite so simple as just putting a battery into an NMR machine and doing NMR. They're the very practical things that the RF power that you excite with the coil can't get through the battery pack. And then there are more practical things. Sometimes there are safety incidents. And then just from an NMR perspective, the types of materials we have in the systems from the metals to the electrolytes have very different properties. And so we need to be able to develop the NMR methods that are specific to the, the metals, the paramagnetic, often active materials and the diamagnetic components. And we need to prevent pickup um, from the electrochemical signal 
getting into the NMR coil and ruining the, the pickup and the signal to noise. And so what my group has done over the last few years is to develop new cell design. So this is the initial plastic bag battery or pouch cell that we use first, moving to more air se um, cells that allow you to deal with air sensitivity of these materials and get pressure on the cells. We've developed systems in collaboration with um, Marco Brown in Germany to uh, develop NMR probes that we can um, put the both the NMR leads but also the electrochemical leads up the, into the magnet. We have piezoelectric motors inside our uh, probes so that we can automatically tune things as we cycle our batteries and the susceptibilities of the, the materials change and the tunings change. And we can jump between frequencies. This is an example where we do lithium NMR and then we drop, jump to phosphorus NMR. And this is all done automatically sitting um, on, on our desks. It's become even more important, of course, when we're now sitting at home in lockdown. So let me just give you some illustrations of the sort of things that we've learned. So our first applications were in the area of silicon. And silicon is a material that a lot of people are studying because it has, in principle, a tenfold of increasing capacity both gravimetrically and volumetrically over carbon. And that's partly because four lithiums can react with, um, with the silicon to produce this enormous capacity increase. The problem with it, though, is that the expansion and contraction of the silicon exposes new surfaces that can react with the electrolyte. And you form uh, electrodes that end up being clogged by something called the SEI, or the solid electrolyte interface. And ultimately, this then results in a decrease in capacity. And also, you can, you can imagine that this would imp increase in the impedance or the difficulty of the lithium ions getting through this um, thick mess. So it's a lot of work is being done globally to try and um, improve the functioning of silicon in batteries. But actually, we were one of the first to um, use our in-situ NMR methodology to really understand what was going on. And so this is our in-situ NMR showing lithiation. So when you lithiate this material, you form um, a series of silicon clusters. So here's one cluster, for example, containing silicon, silicon dumbbells, it gives rise to these peaks at positive PPM. And then we saw this new environment, Li15SI4, which we never saw when we did ex situ measurements. And it turned out that it was an environment where extra lithium is inserted into this material. But when you sit the battery at rest, and I'll just show the movie again, uh, you can, and you watch it over time, you can see that this signal gradually disappeared. And by about 600 minutes, the signal had totally disappeared. And this was then, or at least we ascribe this to the um, fact that you don't form a nice passivating layer and the lithium plus X silicon four phase is so reactive, it, it, ox it gets oxidized itself and reduces the electrolyte. And so this is one of the first examples of an in situ measurement where we could directly see that the silicon form phases were metastable. Unless you put a passivating layer on, you weren't going to be able to use this material commercially. I'll give you another example now in supercapacitors. So supercapacitors are extremely fast um, charging and discharging devices. They sort of bridge a capacitor, a normal dielectric capacitor, and a lithium ion or lithium primary battery. And there are simple devices where you have a high surface area carbon, typically a coconut carbon that's been activated to make these beautiful hierarchical structures. And when you charge, charge up your super cap, you form a double layer on the surface or the internal surfaces of these materials. And these um, super caps are in the emergency exit systems of the new air buses, and they're in your mobile phones, and they're what allows you to take um, flashes, for example, in a, in a camera. And so what we did was to modify our in situ device so that we could follow the ions going in and out of the supercapacitor carbons. And so this is now the fluorine NMR of the BF4 minus ion going in and out as you're charging up the electrode positively and negatively. And so this is the, car, the signal of the ions that are going in and in, in and out of the pores. So at zero volts, they're negative, and then they shift to the left as you charge the material um, to positive voltages. And what you're seeing is the same phenomena that chemists are very use, used to in doing NMR of aromatic materials. So if you're an iron sitting on top of the sheets 
that are largely graphitic or graphene-like, you see the large ring currents that you would see in a benzene molecule. And if you live on top of a benzene ring, you have a negative shift. If you live in the same plane, you have a positive shift. And so this shift to the right is due to the ring currents. And then we, when we charge at the supercap positively, we inject holes into the systems and it becomes less aromatic and it shifts to the left. <clears throat> so we can understand the mechanisms for charge um, for the NMR signal. The question is, can we use it to understand charging mechanisms? And there are various mechanisms proposed in the literature where ions could be either kicked out or ions could be pushed in or they could exchange as you charge up the system positively or negatively. And by simply quantifying the number of anions and the number of cations that went into the system, you were able to show that under certain regimes with ion exchange mechanisms and other regimes, only one set of cations went in, in this case, some uh, phosphorus-based systems. And so this allowed us a new mechanism to really understand how these supercaps function. We're also interested in sodium ion batteries. I talked about the issue of resources. And so one obvious way of moving beyond lithium is to replace the lithium by sodium, which is much more abundant. And it's almost a sort of drop-in technology where you can use the same approaches and the same, almost the same electrolytes for lithium as in sodium, but you can reduce cost because of the higher natural abundance. And you can also replace the copper current collector by aluminium. One of the problems though is that you can't insert sodium into graphite. And so instead, people have proposed these hard carbons, which are amorphous forms of, of carbons with it containing graphene, graphene or graphite sheets that are a little bit larger in size so that you can still intercalate the sodium ions into them. And by using NMR, we're able to follow the processes that go on. And we can show that the first processes you discharge is associated with diamagnetic environments near defects. And then the next process involves the intercalation and the formation of metallic sodium. We can also look at new materials for so sodium batteries. And this is an example where we've used um, sodium NMR to look at the tin anode, to watch the different phases that are formed, and also use a second complementary technique, in this case, pair distribution function analysis, to look at the original tin structure, then transforming to an amorphous structure, and then transforming back to crystalline structure. And by combining these two techniques, we were able to solve the structure of the different sodium tin phases that are formed. So what about safety? So the Dreamliner battery was an example of a new lithium ion system that um, had safety issues a number of years ago and caused the Dreamliner to be grounded for a full year while they, say, while they sorted out the battery issues. And one of the major uh, sources of the problem at least was believed to be associated with the formation of lithium dendrites. So even when you charge graphite and you charge it too fast, the lithium doesn't, hasn't got time to intercalate into the graphitic sheets. And it for, instead it forms these mossy lithium structures that if they start to grow towards the positive electrode can cause a short circuit. Now what we identified was that uh, NMR, um, as I mentioned before, when it hits a metal, has a problem of a skin depth. And what that means is that the radio frequency fields can only penetrate a certain amount. And for lithium, it's about 15 microns. And so what that means is you can see the lithium dendrites, but if you look at a lithium metal slab, you can only see about the first 10 to 15 microns. So we came up with a clever way of using that to track dendrite formation. This is a simple example where we're using a so-called symmetric cell where the lithium is going backwards and forwards you have a constant amount of lithium and we're increasing the current. Now watch what happens when the current density increases. We see a new signal and that's the signal due to the dendrite growing. So effectively, we're increasing the surface area of lithium metal because of these high surface area dendritic structures and the signal grows. Interestingly, at the same time the signal grows, you can also see an increase in the signal around zero ppm. And this is the growth of the surface electrode interface passivating the silicon. And so not only does uh, a lithium dendrites a safety issue, they also consume lithium in the cell, forming this inactive phase on top. And so that is another reason for capacity fade. And on the right at the same time, the movie that's been going on at this time is the same thing for sodium metal, where you're watching the formation of sodium dendrites, even at very low current densities. So how do dendrites grow? So we use magnetic resonance imaging to, as a method to look at this. 
And what you do in this case, you have lithium. Um, we can look at both the lithium in black and the lithium electrolyte. And we're flowing current so that the lithium ions flow in this direction. The counter anions, in this case, PF6 minus flow in the opposite direction. Only the lithium can deposit and the PF6 minuses can't. And so what you see is the formation of this electrolyte concentration gradient. Now let's watch the lithium metal. So first of all, you see the formation of this sort of mossy structure. But when the concentration drops to zero, it grows dendritic. This is more clearly seen in chemical shift imaging, which is um, also used in medical imaging as functional MRI. Uh, you can see the formation of mossy structures, and then it grows dendritic. And the mechanism behind this is that when you, the electrolyte concentration de depletes and goes to zero near the lithium metal, you have a space charge or an electric field that basically drags the lithium dendrites across the structure. And this has been established before, but had not been seen directly in situ. And there's some theory associated with this where you can actually calculate the time in which you will go from mossy structure to dendritic structure, and the time this happened is called the sans time. And we can measure the experimentally determined um, sans time or electrolyte depletion time, and you can see at low currents, our NMR experiments or MRI experiments fit those of the theory. So you might well then say, why don't you just decrease the current? And then you'd never get into a regime where you would actually see electrolyte depletion as shown here. But the problem, as shown in this image here, is that you still grow dendrites, to still grow dendrites. And the reason for that is this continual formation of this passivating layer that I was discussing, or the SEI, that forms this inhomogeneous or heterogeneous coating where some parts of the coating have gaps that are exposed and some um, are much more resistive. And that creates, again, a structure that promotes dendrite formation. And so the challenge now is to improve both our understanding of this SEI and to make a smoother SEI. And so what we've done to address this is to um, use different additives. And one of the most common additives is a fluorine ethylene carbonate. And then we measure the transport through the lithium um, S, through the SEI by isotope exchange experiments. And these are very simple experiments where we put lithium metal, say we take lithium six metal, and we put it in a lithium-7 electrolyte, and then we can quantify the exchange between the lithium-6 and the lithium-7. And what you're seeing in this measurement here is that transport through the SCI and FEC is much faster than an LP30, the standard electrolyte, and that has a dramatic effect on the nature of the dendrites that you form. So this is the dendrites that you form uh, with a normal electrolyte, and this is the, these are the much flatter and more homogeneous ones and lower surface areas that you form with FEC. So we're trying to understand both uh, the mechanisms by which dendrites form, but also then how we can improve and in, try and mitigate their formation. I wanted to touch on a new exciting experiment that we've just come up with this year, where we use something called dynamic nuclear polarization. This is a method where you transfer magnetization from electrons to the nuclei to make use of the much larger gyromagnetic, electro, gyromagnetic ratio of the electron, which is more than a thousandfold larger than protons. And here we're going back to very early DNP experiments that were originally invented for lithium metal and using the uh, unpaired electrons in, in lithium metal to polarize the lithium nuclei. And so this is an example now of lithium metals with and without the microwaves. So the microwaves are used to excite the electrons, and in blue is without microwaves, and in red is with microwaves. And so we can see basically the lithium metal signal was, as was done by um, Charlie Slichter and others more than 40 years ago. But what we've done to move beyond the original pioneering work is to transfer magnetization from the electrons now to the passivating layer, or the SEI that I've been talking about, to see the lithiums, the protons, and fluorines and really understand what's present at that metal diamagnetic interface. And I think this is a way that's really going to allow us to understand the exact chemistry at this particular interface that's responsible for causing dendrites. Sadly, uh, one of the hopes was to move away from a liquid electrolyte and move into an all solid state battery, where you replace a liquid with a lithium ion solid state conductor. 
And the hope was that was that would also prevent dendrites. So these are some of our early MRI studies showing that even uh, in a solid state battery, if you don't optimize the way that the composite is formed, you can still form these dendritic structures or mossy structures that completely envelop the ceramic particles, in this case of LSO or lithium lanthanum zirconate. And you can track the formation of the mossy structures in this very faint pattern here by magnetic resonance imaging. And you can then ask, how do the dendrites or the mossy structures grow with time and relate that to the electrochemistry that's being seen. So I just want to end with an idea about, which I think will be interesting to many of the chemists in the audience, but how we scale up and how we decouple the materials from the electrochemistry. And the way that one could think about doing this is to use a so-called redox flow battery, where you have vats of reduced and vats of oxidized materials, and you flow them in when you want to do electrochemistry. And these systems are similar to fuel cells, except they're reversible. So you can both generate power and then you can turn it, the system the other way around and recharge your battery. Now, the sort of semi-commercial systems are based on vanadium, where on one side you've got a vanadium 2 plus 3 plus couple, and the other side you've got a vanadium 4 plus 5 plus couple. Uh, but they're expensive. And so Michael Aziz's group in Harvard a number of years ago came up with, or five, five years now ago, came up with some quinone-based systems, which are both cheaper and have good um, voltage windows that are stable in aqueous electrolytes. So the aim of the game is to get into aqueous electrolytes. The problem is, though, they suffer from degradation. And so the quinones um, fade in the original generation very quickly. His group has come up with next generation materials that are much more improved. But the challenge is still to get systems that can last for the lifetime of the grid. And so what we've done now is to build an in-situ NMR set up a redox flow battery. And this is very simple because we can just take our redox flow battery and we can flow our liquids now into an NMR machine in the same way that people do online measuring. And that allows us to track what's going on in this very simple manner. And so this is now the first um, NMR studies of the quinone system. There are three protons that we can see in the quinone system, and this is the water resonance. And what's interesting when you um, charge your battery, which results in the reduction of the quinone molecule, first to the radical and then to the, um, the four minus anion case where you put in two electrons, is that you see the th two resonances disappearing very quickly and the third shifts and then it comes back to the resonances of the diamagnetic system. And even the water resonance shifts. We can do DFT and we can show that the um, B molecule, sorry, the proton B has the smallest hyperfine shift which is probably why we can still. But there's some other questions or other interesting things. And the first thing we noticed was that we could, or first thing we worked out was that we could use the shift of the water resonance as simply a way of measuring the radical concentration by a very standard method called the Evans method that's been used by many for many years by inorganic chemists to measure susceptibility. And that allowed us to quantify the radical concentration, which you can see in 50% state of charge only reaches 50% of concentration. And that's because the chemistry is complicated. You end up with these comproportionation reactions where the, the, um, the radical disproportionates into the two diamagnetic components. And from that, we can actually work out the equilibrium constants of the processes and it rationalizes the CV. There's another interesting thing, and that's why that the signals disappear almost immediately. And this is due to electron transfer processes that occur between the radical and the diamagnetic species. We can use that now. We can study the two, the two site exchange processes that happen as a function of temperature. And that allows us to extract activation barriers. And so we've been able to quantify how fast the electron transfer happens in these processes. We can go on and we can do an operando detection. And that means putting the system or the, the battery inside the magnet, and that allows us to de detect both the quinone, but also the chemistry on the other side, in this case, the reactions of the iron two and iron three cyanides. And we can see everything at the same time. And then we can take our flow, and we can flow it from the NMR machine into an ESR machine, and even into an UV-Vis spectrometer to track all of the chemistries 
with different analytical methods. And this is really providing a very powerful way of tracking degradation chemistries. So I wanted to end um, by saying that we've worked on systems with um, not just this detection of um, chemistries that have been done before, but we've also been designing materials with even higher mobility. And these are systems based on um, perovskites with much more complicated chemistries where we can prevent the structural transformations that occur when you lithiate them. And we can um, end up with some very high lithium transport materials that are almost best in class. And we can make batteries that we can cycle up to uh, one minute, to, uh, as fast as one minute charges and discharges. We can quantify how fast lithium ions move by using pulse grade, field gradient measurements. And we can see that our materials are really as good as any lithium ion conducting materials. And so with that, I'd like to end by just um, reminding you all that I hope I've shown you that by using NMR and MRI, coupled with different characterization techniques, we can really study a whole variety of different battery technologies and supercapacitors and understand um, how structures of materials look at safety issues and then move on to new chemistries and touching in the end in these high rate niobates. And I'm ho I hope that as the battery market grows fast, there's room for very different different chemistries, but growth should be sustainable. And with that, I'd like to end by thanking my wonderful research group. This was my group in a group retreat last year um, when we were able to go. Uh, sadly, this couldn't happen this year because of lockdown. Key people I should mention, Ollie and Barish for the in-situ development and Rangit uh, for the lithium dendrite work, Alex, John and Hal for the supercaps and particularly Evan for the redox flow and Kent for the niobates. And thank you very much for listening to me, despite uh, the terrible issues with internet and my computer. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gray, for this fascinating talk and uh, beautiful insights into capacities of uh, in situ NMR techniques and uh, very unique uh, spectroelectrochemical techniques in, in many senses. So there are a number of questions. I find it particularly fascinating moving into the redox flow batteries, but I will bring up a few questions that, that came uh, through, throughout the chat. Uh, one of them refers to moving from lithium to sodium-based batteries. So the question refer refers to what modifications have been made, are, are made for NMR to measure uh, lithium and sodium signals? So that's relatively straightforward because sodium is another 100% active nucleus. It's a more quadrupolar nucleus, and so there are challenges associated with that. But then you can use the, the larger quadrupole to understand um, more about the distortions of the, lo the local environments. And so, for example, in some of our work on sodium tin systems, we were able to use the different sodium quadrupoles to understand local environments. But basically, not much. Uh, you can see that the sodium metal has a bigger shift than the lithium metal, which is, is interesting in itself. But uh, we've been very lucky that it's basically transferable. It's also very promising in terms of facilitating the transfer to, to other technologies and, and also moving away from lithium. Yeah, then I would um, say that you know, we also, the, the next technology involves magnesium, and we've done magnesium NMR, but that's a much more challenging nucleus. I mean, that's a low gap. Is mm -hmm. abundant. So I wouldn't like to pretend that everything is straightforward. It just so happens that lithium and sodium are, are low-hanging fruits that are easier. I, I see here that uh, there, there was a lack of clarity whether some of the work has been published um, you know, on this topic. And there was a question for um, for the link. I guess uh, the, the attendees might refer directly for this information. And there is also an, a question on maybe the technical representation. It seems that the attendees have also appreciated the animation of the evolution of some of the, the signals. And they're actually asking about whether, uh, what kind of, um, how, how have you demonstrated this technical, or, or so, uh, what kind of applications have you used for demonstrating this? That was very helpful to illustrate. So everything I talked about has been published and I'd be very happy to, um, to send references if people would like to email me directly. Um, we have used a variety of software to make movies. I mean, standard 
movie software, nothing particularly imaginative. But you collect data, you know, at different time intervals, and this, the rate, rate at which you collect them depends on how sensitive the nucleus is, and then we speed them up. Um, but the the evolution has of the the software we've used has evolved, but it's nothing particularly um, clever. I mean, we then synchronize the spectra with the electrochemistry, and again, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do, at least for my students. I wouldn't pretend that um, I would find it so straightforward, but. <laughs> it is it is beautiful also to be able to, to yeah. follow. And the, we have done the same thing with the MRI as well. I didn't show many of the magnetic resonance imaging ones, but those are often more cool. And maybe two final questions from uh, Ahmed Ella. Uh, uh, first one being, what are the limitations of in-situ lithium analysis and batteries and whether these approaches can be used for evaluating the conduction mechanisms in polymers? So, I mean, I, you know, I need to be completely honest about this. All I showed you was not with magic angle spinning. And so it's all static and it works particularly when you have quite mobile species, mobile lithium and sodium, so that you still get sharp resonances. But there are cases when things are very paramagnetic and you get very broad signals. And there we've been able to do things like measure T1s and look at the lithium dynamics. But we are looking at conducting polymers, for example. And we are uh, both in the bioelectronics space and the sort of solar space. Where, and look, we've looked at gated electronics. And the challenges are always sensitivity, uh, particularly in applications where you're looking at very thin films. You know, we struggle to look at things in the 50 nanometer regime, which is why we're pushing to the DMP methods that I, I sort of um, talked a little bit about. And also we're struggling, if you look at carbon NMR, when you need to do magic angle spinning. And so there are others, there are people in the field who've tried to do magic angle spinning, and we, we have as well, but uh, it's very difficult to spin a battery because it's metallic and it's liquid and it splurts out everywhere. So this is not the technique for everything. I think you have to choose your problems well and think about what you're trying to get out of it. And often all of everything we do is always coupled with ex situ measurements where we can get higher resolution techniques. We're always looking for things that are metastable, that, that justify the in situ metrology. So, um, you know, the movies are often cool, but we have to do a lot of backup, additional work at the same time to unpick what's going on. Well, thank you very much for, for clarifying these points and, and providing more insights into the, into the possibilities. It has been really a fascinating uh, talk and it really offers a, a great glimpse of uh, what are the opportunities in terms of in-situ analysis of these systems. So thank you very much, thank uh, you. Uh, Professor Gray. And congratulations on the, the so, celebrations. 25 years. <laughs>